All right, well, I have shared before that one of my spiritual battles is uh, an ongoing struggle to be content, like with my material possessions, uh, because there's a part of me that really, really likes stuff. And sometimes, you know, I want more stuff. Sometimes I struggle with bouts of envy because someone has the stuff that I would like to have. And there truly is a part of me that relates to that saying that says, whoever said money can't buy happiness doesn't know where I shop. Because the truth is, I I do think it's fun. I think it's fun to get more stuff and new stuff. And and I know that sounds probably extremely unspiritual, but it is one of my weaknesses, and it's just the way it is. Um, I know it, and some of you know it. And and this weakness um, had really already took root in my life way back when I was a kid. My brothers, they still tease me about the Christmas way back in the 1980s that I had begged my parents for a VCR. Now, uh, for our young people here today, a VCR is is an antique electronic device on which you can play movies. And in the mid-1980s, VCRs were still pretty new to the market, and so they retailed for more than $600. Can you believe that? And so there was no way, no way my parents were going to be buying me a VCR for Christmas, but still I asked, and I prayed for a Christmas miracle. (laughs) Well... As all the torn wrapping paper, you know, settled to the floor that morning, I was really disappointed because I did not get my Christmas miracle. But I didn't give up. (laughs) And this is what my brother still teased me about. Because I spent the rest of Christmas Day trying to convince them to return all of their gifts so that maybe we could scrape all of our money together and I could still get my VCR. And really, I was acting like a spoiled, spoiled brat. And sometimes to this very day, that spoiled brat in me, well, he wants to to surface. And so I need to keep my possessions in perspective, and really we all do. Because stuff is just stuff. You know, it's here today, it's gone tomorrow. Stuff It it becomes rusted, it it wears out, it goes out of fashion, it becomes obsolete. You know, if you try to give me a VCR today, I wouldn't want that. I've got no use for that. It's outdated. And I want us all to understand that in God's economy, possessions or our stuff has no value that, that lasts whatsoever. When we step back, To look at the big picture, you'll see that the cars that we drive, the homes that we live in, the clothes that we wear, and all the trinkets that we collect are very, very temporary. Meanwhile, your baptism into Jesus Christ, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, your relationship with God, your service to him, those are eternally priceless. Now today we continue in our sermon series through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And we've been going, you know, verse by verse through this uh, sermon. And and sometimes we've been going word by word. So we've been taking this uh, pretty slow. um, But I really wanted to just focus on this sermon because this sermon comes straight from Jesus Christ. And so um, I think it's worth spending some time on. And here is what he told The crowd gathered around him that day. He said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great 
is that darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, it's really just a reality that we live in a world that is captive to money and to stuff. And there is such an overemphasis on money that our culture often will even assess a person's very value by how much they're worth. You know, what's your net worth? The multimillionaire is thought to be a big deal and desirable for company. Meanwhile, the impoverished widow is ignored and forgotten. And so the Bible warns us in numerous places to be alert about the dangers of possessions and money. It's something that Jesus talks about a lot. And you know, this morning, I almost didn't speak on this subject because I thought about, you know, I've, I've spoken about money a lot in the past, but then I decided, you know, I need to speak on this because I, I talk about it a lot because God brings it up a lot. In his word, just in the book of Matthew, the Lord mentions money more than 100 times. And I've read in Bible commentaries that God talks about money five times more than any other subject. He knew that this would be something that many of us would struggle with. And so it's very important that we pay attention to this topic. We don't want to get this wrong because it seems we can easily develop a worldly perspective when it comes toward money and stuff. And by the way, <laughs> there are some very common misconceptions about what the Bible says about money. And so I do want to cover a few of those this morning. Uh, one misconception is that it is unspiritual or even wrong to be wealthy. However, there is no principle in the Bible that, that says that it's wrong to be rich. You know, but doesn't the Bible say that money is the root of all evil? No, it doesn't. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. But money is not evil. Instead, money is kind of like dynamite. You know, it can be used for good or it can be used for evil. And there are numerous examples in the Bible of wealthy, godly people. And so it's not wrong to be rich. And if it were, I would say most people here today would be in trouble because by the world standard, we are all pretty well off. So it's not wrong to be rich, but still I think there are, very, there are many generous, hardworking, and godly Christians who feel guilty because God has blessed them financially. But having money and owning homes and possessions and land is not wrong. In fact, sometimes having money and possessions is proof of God's blessings. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, it says that it is God who gives you the ability to produce wealth. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, it says that God gives us richly all things to enjoy. And this is in a section that is about money, and it makes it very clear that God wants us to enjoy it. To be a Christ follower, you don't have to live like a monk or to make a vow of poverty. In fact, God loves to give us good things. He's generous to us. And if you study the history of the world, um, you would find that the nations that have been the godliest have also generally been the, mo the most prosperous. Um, and in the Old Testament, some of the godliest people were also some of the richest. Abraham had vast wealth, and he was called a friend of God. The Bible describes Job as being so wealthy that he could barely count all that he had. And then we see in the book of Proverbs over and over again that we are encouraged to make wise investments and to handle our wealth in a godly way. I like how the New Living Translation puts Proverbs chapter 21, verse 20. It very plainly says that the wise have wealth and luxury, but the fools spend whatever they get. And then in Proverbs 14, 23, it says, all hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. And if you listen 
to financial guru, Dave Ramsey, you probably have heard Proverbs 22, verse 7, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. And so we find wise money advice throughout the Bible, and, and it is there to help us to prosper financially. So there's nothing wrong with that. Now, I want to be careful when talking about God blessing us because I do not subscribe at all to the health and wealth gospel that's become so popular with so many preachers who say things like name it and claim it, or as I like to say, blab it and grab it. However, I do think that if you follow God's word about being a careful spender, a wise investor, and a generous giver, then you shouldn't be surprised when God blesses you with money and possessions. And so I would say don't feel guilty about that. You know, even before Megan and I got married, we were engaged. And, and even then, we had this goal that we wanted to provide for our future children at the time a nice home in a nice neighborhood. And that took a long time. You know, our last neighborhood was so rough that when people came to visit us, they would say they were going on a mission trip. But, you know, Megan and I, we worked and we saved, and then we would have setbacks and our savings would evaporate, but we kept at it. We flipped our fixer-upper house. We bought another fixer-upper house that we flipped. And then Megan worked night shift so that we could save just a little bit more. We worked day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. And then last year, we finally were able to buy our house, the house. Now, it was a fixer-upper too, but it's a nice house in a nice neighborhood. We followed God's biblical principles but do you know what I sometimes feel when I see my house? Guilt. Now, to anybody else, I would say, don't feel guilt or shame for God's blessings. Instead, have a thankful heart and praise God for what he has given you. But it's something I struggle with, and I'm not sure where that comes from. But I don't think it comes from God because he loves to bless his children. And we followed his principles. And again, we see in Scripture that it's not wrong for godly people to have possessions or to have a savings account or to invest. In fact, all of those things are encouraged. And so I guess the question is, what is Jesus telling us here in his Sermon on the Mount? Well, Jesus says that treasure is linked to the heart. So the question is, what does your heart long for? Is it obsessed with, with money or popularity or possessions or power or security? Or does your heart treasure what God treasures? And there are many things that God treasures, and we've covered several of them as we've studied the Sermon on the Mount these last several months. And here's a few of them. God treasures showing mercy. God treasures making peace, being persecuted for the sake of righteousness. He treasures it when we are the light to the world, when we resist anger, when we are faithful to our spouse. He treasures loving our enemies, praying with those, praying for those who persecute us, giving to those in need, practicing forgiveness. Those are some of the things that God treasures, and we should too. You know, then, of course, we should, we should heavily invest in God's kingdom. You know, make no mistake, Jesus is also talking about our money. He makes that very clear when he says in verse 24, No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, some versions of the Bible use the word money in this verse instead of mammon. But mammon is by far the more accurate word because mammon includes all money and all possessions. 
And, and the biblical term mammon also carries a very negative connotation. It was used to describe greed, gluttony, and dishonest worldly gain. Mammon describes covetousness and the idol of materialism. And so when you serve mammon, you will be greedy, you will be envious, and you will covet what other people have. And to covet is really the opposite of contentment. And it can be crippling because the nature of being a servant to mammon is that it is a lifestyle that is never, ever satisfied. It always wants more. And so it's clear that you cannot serve both God and mammon. It reminds me of 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, which tells us, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, I think 1 Kings chapter 21 is one of the clearest examples of serving mammon in the Bible. This chapter contains the story of the wicked king Ahab and his domineering and even more wicked wife Jezebel. And although, they, although these two, this, this couple, they were powerful and they were rich, Ahab was envious of a vineyard that was near his palace. And so he wanted it so badly that he just wanted to take it. But he offered to buy it from this guy named Naboth, um, who owned it. Um, but Naboth didn't want to sell it. And really, it was more than that. Naboth didn't want to sell it partly because it was considered unethical to give up inherited family land at that time. And so Ahab was denied, and he could not stand to be denied. And so he didn't serve God. He served mammon. His treasure was wrapped up in money and possessions. And so after being denied and pouting like a child about it to his wife uh, Jezebel, you know, I kind of picture him curling up his bottom lip and pouting. And he said this, because I spoke to Naboth and said to him, give me your vineyard for money or else I could give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. And then Jezebel, his wife, said to him, you now exercise authority over Israel. Arise, eat, and let your heart be cheerful. I will get you that vineyard. And do you know what the evil Jezebel did? She arranged for two false witnesses to testify that Naboth had cursed God and the king. And these were both crimes that warranted the death penalty in that day. And so Naboth was falsely accused, and then he was wrongly convicted, and then he was dragged outside the city and stoned to death, and then Ahab took the vineyard. So what happened in this story? Well, Ahab the king had a love for stuff. He served mammon, and he coveted, or he had this strong desire for possession that he wanted, and that led to evil, and then eventually murder and of course, serving mammon leads to all kinds of evil today. You know, all you got to do is read the headlines. Anytime you hear about someone stealing something, that is serving mammon. I learned recently that in the city of San Francisco, about a thousand cars per day are being broken into. It's so bad that many people now are just leaving their windows down so that thieves can rummage through the cars without breaking the windows. And that is a society that is worshiping at the altar of mammon. You know, anytime you hear about financial corruption, embezzlement, insider trading, a pyramid scheme, that is serving mammon. Do you know why we so often hear about rich CEOs, rich politicians, rich Hollywood elites being caught up in money scandals? It is because they serve at the altar of mammon. Now, serving mammon can take other forms, too, that don't include committing crimes. Serving mammon is pretty common. So I'm going to give you a few signs that a person, or maybe even someone here today, is serving mammon. And the first is, you don't give. You don't give. If you don't invest in the advancement of God's kingdom, that is a sign 
that you are probably serving mammon. Because remember, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is too. A second sign that you are serving mammon is that you are bondage to debt because of overspending. I'm not talking about hospital bills. If you practice retail therapy, meaning that you buy things just to make yourself feel better and that's putting you in debt, that is a sign that you are serving mammon. Or third, if you have an exaggerated emphasis on money, an exaggerated emphasis on money, you're constantly checking the stock market, you are losing sleep at night over your 401k, or you think yourself superior because you have money and possessions, or you think yourself inferior because you don't have much money or possessions, or you hoard money and your personal wealth and identity is wrapped up in your money and possessions. That's all being a servant to mammon. Proverbs 11.26 says, people curse the man who hoards grain. And so saving is biblical, hoarding is offensive. And so if you have an overflowing abundance, give it away. Give some away. Fourth, we serve mammon when we are envious of other people's wealth and possessions. One of Aesop's uh, fables tells of a man who could have anything that he desired. The catch was that his neighbor uh, would always get twice as much as he. And and so the man wished for a new home, and it was beautiful, but his neighbor's was twice as big. Then he wished for a new horse, and he loved the horse, but it bothered him when his neighbor then got two wonderful horses. He wished for new clothes, and instantly they were his, but his neighbor's clothes were twice as nice. The man was eaten up with envy. And the fable ends with the, ma- with the man wishing to be blind in one eye. I read this week about how depression is now at an epidemic in America. Studies show that there has been this just steady, steady, steady increase in depression ever since World War II, and it continues to rise. And in recent years, it's, it's risen sharply. And, and that seems strange, doesn't it? I mean, we have so many more possessions and comforts than they did back then, right? We do. But do you know what the experts are figuring out? Depression is rising because of the possessions and the comforts. You know, of course our society is depressed. It is serving mammon. And when a person's focus is on material things or how well their situation compares to someone else's, then they not only serve mammon, but they also destroy any hope for contentment and happiness. We can't serve both God and mammon. We can't. We got to pick Where will our hearts be? Where will our treasure be? It was Dr. James Dobson who compared our life to a monopoly game. (laughs) You know, we work hard to accumulate all this money and land and possessions, and then one day, the game is over. We give it all back because it never really belonged to us to begin with. We were just stewards. Suddenly, the dollar bills and the property deeds and the earthly treasures, you know, they just don't matter anymore. What matters is whether we pursued godliness and faith and love, endurance, gentleness. What matters is whether or not we are ready to face God. You know, just yesterday, we celebrated David Van Meter, who recently crossed over from this life into the next, and David's treasure was Jesus. And he had he had just this incredible amount of peace in his last days. And I'm telling you, that is very unusual, even for dedicated Christians. But, but he knew that he soon would be leaving here to go to his heavenly home. And I think David is a really good example of what I'm talking about today, because David lived by these biblical principles. He seemed to be a careful spender, a wise investor, 
and a generous giver. David and Paul of Ammeter seem to have figured um, all of this out as they have lived below their means so that they can be free to give. It was John Tillotson who said, He who provides for this life but takes no care for eternity is wise for a moment, but a fool forever. So let me ask you, are you invested in eternity? Hebrews 9 verse 27 says, It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. And the judgment for our sins is eternal separation from God. But thankfully, God gave his son Jesus as the way for our sins to be forgiven. You know, he got me, and he got David, and he got so many of, so many of us out of a debt that we could never, ever repay. Jesus paid it all. He will pay your sin debt if you let him, if you would trust him today. So let's stand, and we're going to pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of, of life and all the good things that you give to us. And we recognize that every day is, is precious and every investment that we make matters. And so we pray that you would help us to be good managers of the time and the talent and the treasure that you have entrusted to us. May we make the most of what you've gifted us. <laughs> You've blessed us with so much, and that means that we have a, a lot of responsibility because to much is given, much is required. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to be good stewards of what you've provided. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.